<clears throat> Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining Partners in Health today for our satellite session on advocating for social assistance as a critical component of universal health care um, as part of the sixth global symposium on health systems research. Um, my name is Emily Rowe. I'll be the moderator and I'm delighted to introduce you to my fellow speakers. Um, I'll start with Dr. Fernay Leand. Dr. Fernay is a physician and HIV TB specialist who cur currently serves as a senior health and policy advisor at Partners in Health. He previously served at Zami La Santé, Partners in Health's sister organization in Haiti for over 20 years, most recently as the chief programs officer. Beginning in 1998, Dr. Leandra directed Zami La Santé's integrated HIV AIDS, TB and STIs program in central Haiti, one of the first in the world to treat HIV positive poor people with antiretroviral therapy in an impoverished setting. Dr. Leandra is also instructor in the Department of Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Fernay, can you turn on your video and say hello to everyone? Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll next introduce Basimene Hema, as, who is the Community Health Director at Partners in Health in Malawi. Ms. Hema is a community health practitioner who is currently leading and managing interdisciplinary teams focusing on community health worker programs and the program on social and economic rights for Partners in Health in Malawi. Um, she goes by Sime. Sime, can you turn on your camera and say hello to us? Hi, everyone. And uh, it's so much of a pleasure to be here in this session today. Thank you. Great. Um, next, we have Dr. Amelia Connolly, who is a health systems implementer currently working in Nano, Malawi, with community and clinical teams to strengthen the healthcare system and work toward achievement of universal healthcare. She oversees the social assistance program in the district as a critical part of achieving health for all individuals in the community. Um, Dr. Emmy, can you turn on your camera and say hi? Hello, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, next, we have Dr. Rebecca Cook, who is the Director of Clinical Services and Medical Education at Partners in Health in Liberia. Dr. Cook is an internist and pediatrician who has been working with PIH Liberia since 2016, partnering with the Ministry of Health frontline providers to improve patient care in the referral hospital, train young Liberian doctors and nurses, and advocate for high quality patient-centered services for most vulnerable patients. She also serves as clinical instructor in internal medicine and pediatrics at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Uh, Rebecca, can you say hello? Hi everyone, it's a privilege to be here. Thanks, Emily. Thank you so much. Um, I, we have two additional panelists who will be joining us shortly from Liberia and I'll introduce um, them when they join. To round this out, again, I'm um, Emily Rowe. I'm a physician. Um, I work at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and Harvard Medical School and have worked with Partners in Health for uh, the past 12 years, uh, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa, working on community health worker programs and clinical services in the in the district of Nano, where Sime and Emmy are joining us from today. Um, and for the past eight months, I've been working on the COVID response in the state of Massachusetts in the United States as the director of implementation and design for the statewide contact tracing program. Um, so as, as you have heard, a lot of us have worked together across different um, across different sites for Partners in Health, and we're excited to talk to you today about the, um, here's, here is our agenda, and we're going to really go into some practical experience on the ground of um, social support and social assistance programs. Um, we will have each um, presentation followed by about five minutes of Q&A, um, and then we can have some panel style questions at the end. Um, as a brief introduction, wanted to introduce everyone to this concept um, of the five S's, uh, really looking at the complex systems needed to solve complex programs um, and, sorry, complex problems. So when we think about health systems, we think about staff, our HR, our stuff, our supplies, our space, the buildings that we work in. Um, as well as the systems. And the fifth S is what we frame as social support. 
understanding there's no single silver bullet to solve for global health equity and really taking on the will and imagination to improve complex integrated systems. Um, as our panelists prepared to speak with you today, there's a couple of key points that we wanted to share with you as an introduction, um, really acknowledging that the fifth S is taking care of, of inaction and really addressing what it takes to help someone or a patient succeed and achieve um, the, the most optimal health that they can. Um, we, you will hear us talk about a, a very um, a biosocial approach to medicine and to patient care. And you will hear us talk about how we recruit from the communities where we work and adapt approaches to address this fifth S, the social support in complex settings. You'll hear about boots on the ground approaches to address the most complex social determinants of health that we see in very complex settings. And what we are here talking about today is advocating for this idea of social support being a missing piece of universal health care and how to, how to position that as part of UHC and really how to operationalize that. So in today's session, you'll hear from implementers with decades of experience on the ground who've looked at launching social assistance programs in a variety of diverse contexts. Um, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Fernay on social assistance in Haiti, as well as applying those lessons um, to serve uh, farming communities in Immokalee, Florida. Then Sime and Emmy will talk about design principles and innovations from social assistance work that they are leading in, in Nano, Malawi. Um, I will then talk about how we've applied social assistance work as part of the statewide contact tracing program in Massachusetts. And then Maxo, Ashley, and Rebecca of the Liberia team will, will talk about PIH Liberia's mantra of, quote, the patients are our bosses and how that shapes their approach to social assistance. We'll aim to verbally answer um, one to three questions after each presentation, and then we can have about 30 minutes at the end for a panel style discussion. Um, so with that, we will get started. Um, Dr. Fernay is up and let me know when to advance the slides. Okay, thanks, Emily. Um, it's really a pleasure to be part of this uh, discussion today. And as my motivation and interest in this topic, specifically the social support, addressing the social determinant of health, traced back from 1998, when I was working as a medical director at the Pavillon Tom White, and which is an infectious disease unit. And the patients start calling it uh, poverty clinic. I take time to understand is it because we take um, time to, to listen to their social problem and help them navigate to connected connect to the resources they might need. And this become, well, this spread out the message that there's a poverty clinic. And our ground for the social support, uh, the philosophic and moral grounds is um, encoded in the German physician anthropologist, prehistorian, Ludwig Karvichov, which said as, um, Physician are the natural attorney of the poor. And oh, next slide, please. And social problem fall to a, a large next time, yeah, fall to a large extent with the jurisdiction. And to the extent to that, we could see the definition uh, of poverty by Jim Kim in 2018 that encompass a shortfall in income and also poor health and nutritional outcome. And we need, we must understand and measure, this is the same measure and that which of talk about. We have to wait life to for life in our measurement and see where the death life ticker. Is it among the workers or among the privileged? And we could, see this with uh, the, the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. Focusing on Haiti, as you know, it is the most dense and uh, we have uh, the most demographic uh, density 
are in the Caribbean region. And it's next slide, and we have uh, the state of population health completely, um, I would say, worsening from year to year. And even with all of those investments, but not enough, uh, we have made some progress on the HIV prevalence, which is down from one uh, to 1.6, from 5 point, um, from even 12% uh, at that, uh, at the beginning, uh, at the end of uh, 80s, uh, uh, 1980s. But uh, since 2010, we, we have made a lot of progress. Next slide. And, but we still remain the struggle with the poverty women and uh, steady. And as we could see, uh, we are the, I Haiti is the 22nd, is ranked 22nd among the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And we've, since last year, for example, we have a depreciation um, uh, of the goods. Like, for example, in 2013, we need one, uh, one for one dollar we need for the modern for the three goods, but by August 2020, last August we need 120 goods. It is almost uh, three times, and this is come with a rampant rampant inflation, and we have see that uh, more than half of the population uh, fall on the poverty line, and in extreme poverty we have 40 percent of that. 40% of the population on the extreme poverty line, with meaning less than uh, one dollars, one less than one dollars point twelve. But uh, in addition to that, we have inadequate war and the expense uh, in health spending is the lowest in in the region. All of the struggle. Next slide, please. Uh, drive us to step back and looking at uh, what our program uh, in HIV is, since this is where we have been uh, most successful uh, for the last uh, two decades. We could see this study, the case study is about uh, one of the OVC, which is often on vulnerable children. This is a girl of 21, 21 years old. Among the first generation, born HIV free from our PMTCT program started in 1996 at Seattle. And her mother died 10 years ago, her father is struggling to, to make a meet. And she's uh, the oldest uh, who has benefited uh, the social and financial support since her uh, infancy in that program. And now at the second year at the University of Notre Dame, uh, studying um, human science. But she had from some time participate in, in national beauty context, uh, but the struggle still remain. But what do you think this girl will become in a setting like Haiti with such deep poverty? Even with our social support for school and living condition from time to time due to the current degradation of living condition, which is worse for the most vulnerable, we we I just received, I would say, uh, some alert like loss of hope, like the quote from her um, below. It is in Creole. I didn't translate it for many reasons. But the five we are supporting her, for example, with five thousand goods, which is uh, less than one hundred dollars at the uh, exchange rate today. Uh, but we know that it is nothing. But uh, has things become harder since the COVID and all of those things? They have to get home study. And uh, she asked if we could support her with a computer and also the money, if we could get some ways. But you see, um, so when I put in bowl, it is um, I'm starving because now I have to pay more for, for food I, and I have to also make copies and for the school I have to pay transportation and I, have, I don't have any other incomes, but this is the struggle of most of the young people exposed to the scarcity and the starvation, why they are 
uh, struggling to make a living. Next slide. And in this group, the social support in Haiti from Zamila Santé, I'll take a look on the last year, uh, last fiscal year report, July 19 to June 20. Um, this, we always have support group that uh, we put people together to keep them in like kind of a solidarity. Uh, we realize all of those numbers, but the most interesting uh, you could see the school we visit to support some primary school for people. And the total number of patients and kids receiving financial assistance is at more than 8,000. But you see OVC, often and Global Children, receiving food support, food. And it is uh, more than 2, 000, almost 3,000 people. And we have also some kind of cash transfer and conditional or for some special assistance. And we have also income generating activities provided and a lot of direct assistance. We could see, next slide, um, and we could have a summary of, of the side and the school that we are supporting. Those uh, activities are funded by Global Fund, Carry, Spepfa, and our own uh, unrestricted uh, money at PIH. And we, as you could see, uh, for a total of more than 12,000 people OVC enrolled um, within all, all the 12 sides, we have most of the side here. Uh, and you could see also we have to, uh, there were HIV status, all of those continue since the last two decades. Next slide, please. But we need to assess the importance of this social support. This is why we conduct um, many um, survey to see uh, as survival uh, women the outcome of NTOS in the most critical or the most critical indicators of treatment success. We need to evaluate the risk factor for mortality, and we did that for those among those patients receiving AIT. Um, but we find in the literature mostly it is from the hybrid and we, we have seen the, the study and sub-Saharan African low-income country but not in, in low income as in Haiti. And to better understand the risk factor for adverse outcome among people with HIV receiving longitudinal care in a low setting, this is why we, we try to understand as we have uh, a, um, a prevalence um, falling down since 2000, even seven years before the global decline in HIV death. We, we conduct this study recently with uh, on four, more than 400 people. Next slide, please. And uh, the, the baseline point was data collected in June 2010 and and, and the clinical status was collected in November, to, in November 2017. I would come of interest, it is risk factor for mortality, as I said before. Next slide, please. And our finding, we find that impoverishment itself would be, could be considered as a criterion for eligibility for social support for people with HIV. And that funding for a broader scope of social support programming should be consider with a goal of improving long-term outcome in Haiti and similar setting. Also, the poor world function quality of life was independently associated with risk of mortality. And we, you could see the two questions we asked to evaluate this. And independent association between single marital status and risk of death that uh, uh, prove the support uh, the family support on important it is in improve it to improve HIV outcome. See next time significant variation uh, in mortality by side, uh, despite uh, similar staffing resources, clinical protocols, social services support and supervision are really needed. But 
we know that there's um, some variation in geographic area based on the type of work, based on, um, uh, for example, in the in some Antibon equation, we have uh, more LGBT uh, people. There's a variation between uh, in the mortality by side, but. Uh, having income generating activities uh, was an independent risk factor, but we know that we need to ad adjust uh, our uh, schedule for appointment, things like this. Because people, so most of the time, they couldn't take uh, days off, and this is the same kind of uh, challenge for, for the COVID. And uh, in conclusion, we could say for this, uh, uh, for, from the lesson learned, poverty and single marital status were directly and independently associated with mortality and age, world function, quality of life, and CD4 count were inversely and independently associated with mortality in a quarter of people with HIV, but we see this in other disease, uh, chronic disease also. Uh, our findings suggested, uh, next, uh, next slide please. Our findings suggested that assessment of a patient's socioeconomic condition should be included as part of the routine HIV care and that social protection should be evaluated as a strategy to further reduce mortality in all of those chronic disease. Uh, same same constant, same observation is done with COVID pandemic. And as we come next slide to Imakole to support the team here, uh, what we call, we were, Imakole, we realized those same challenges. And one of the case studies from Imakole, next slide, it is um, a woman, while we were conversing in the community, the health promoters met Serena, this is a, a, a first name, a resident of low income housing development in Immaculate. Immaculate is a place where we have a lot of farm workers, migrant farm workers. Serena has three young children and is pregnant with her fourth baby. After becoming sick with COVID 19, she was hospitalized and, and had stopped working during her recovery. She is now three months behind on rent and facing evictions. The health promoters refer them to Mission Penel and, and who pay the rent completely. And now Serena is lifted out of the death cycle and can focus on investing on her children. Also children can continue to school from home and long-term social, economic and development impact on Serena and her family. This is the type of model of connection that people living in the Imakole, Imakole is, which is located in Collier County. Collier County in Southern Florida is where we have Naples. And Naples, this is the sixth, sixth, sixth highest uh, number of uh, billion, millionaire uh, in, in the in USA, you could understand, but it happened that Imakole is in that uh, county. And okay, home for community uh, migrant farm workers, the population around 20,000 to 40,000 at the harvest time. And in mid June, uh, Immaculate was the zip code with the highest density of COVID cases, which is not surprising due to the difficult living and working condition in Immaculate. Uh, the risk, the increased risk of infection and poor health, as you could see in the picture. Next slide, please. As you could see in the picture we, uh, of the trailers. In, in these trailers, we have uh, more than 10 people living and each have to pay like $300 a month for the room. And they come by, by head, which is head count. But it is, there's no way you could Particular isolation and also social uh, distancing, even in the trailers, in the buses, many people can, cannot afford to stay home if they do become sick. Food insecurity, eviction, lot of uh, loss of utilities, and those are, are trigger this um, 
the zip code that become the highest density of COVID case in the first wave. Next, please. And with the boots on the ground to which the most vulnerable we are in the United States now to social support, COVID-19 response, what we plan, what we have done since we support the team here and the Minister of Health and some, some local partner here, uh, individual will be forced to go, um, will be forced to go to work to prevent starvation eviction. But in terms of health equity, living and working condition that put immaculate resident, specifically the farm workers, family, uh, at risk of COVID-19, we provide the social support is crucial to alleviate the disproportionate burden that the pandemic has placed on vulnerable, on these vulnerable communities. And also it is important to rebuild the trust in the health system. It is an opportunity to begin necessary reparation after history of exploitation and marginalization of the community. We catalyze also opportunity the, to catalyze the international and equitable um, the redistribution of resources to support social and economic growth. Next slide, please. Social support coordination in the macro system, as you could see, uh, the reference from her promoters to mission panel, to mission panel, uh, if people uh, are in need, then we, we have to follow up on, on the need. But as a matrix, what we measure uh, this is the um, number of people identified with resources need, number of people referred to resources, number of people receiving resources. But now it is also number of people uh, referred and not only receiving resources, but for pre-existing condition connected to medical care. And even we have uh, undocumented the with ongoing population, undocumented population, try to connect them to, to the healthcare they might need. And um, for now, the number is not that big as in Haiti, as you could see, because it is uh, just the beginning from September to November, since we pushed to have boots on the ground and this social support, we could see that uh, the number of households receiving social support, uh, it is still, um, low, and, but the number of individuals uh, reached with social support to health promoters, it is uh, 62. But uh, we, we are still pushing to speed up. Uh, we will recruit more community health workers and train them in this type of work, as we believe those people could not do better if I would any uh, social support and clinical referral. And I will uh, end with this same quote from uh, Woodrow Vichov, physician at the natural autonomy of the poor and social problem fall to a large extent within the jurisdictions. Medical statistics will be our standard of measurement and with life for life and see where the death life ticker among the workers, among the privileged. As we have seen in the Pavilion Tom White and even in Immacolay, uh, where the death light ticker uh, strike stronger, where the disease strike stronger among the workers, among the farm workers. But we will wait for questions. Thank you. Next slide, please. Wait. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernay. Um, so we have time for one question. Rebecca, would you be able to read um, the question from the Q&A? And as a reminder to all the participants today, um, thank you for joining us if you joined late. On the right side of the screen um, on the website where you joined this session, there's a live Q&A part where you can type in questions and after each presentation, we'll do a couple of questions. Go ahead, Rebecca. 
So the, the question is actually to all the panelists. Um, and it was, I'm sorry, my thing is just reloading now, but basically was asking for all the panelists, what are your recommendations for civil service organization, organizations in terms of interfacing with uh, ministry leaders um, to advocate for social support within national policies and financing? Yeah, the, the recommendation on my side is uh, not only to include social support in all of the project, but uh, the basic, the gown of that is, is uh, health equity, as uh, suggested, see where the death toll is higher and to address and bring, uh, to address the social determinant, understanding the social determinant of the, this adverse outcome and address them because at the end of the day, the main indicators is of uh, treatment or for the health program is the treatment success and get people back to a uh, function, the world function of quality of life. This is uh, one of the focus, keep pushing to have uh, this fifth S in all of the project, bilateral, national, get the buy-in from uh, the, but this civil society we already believe because they are the one now uh, bearing the, uh, I would say the weight of this and on their shoulder, but they could better advocate, help us advocate. And, but physician has to document it, measure, have the statistic measurement of all of this to be more efficient in the advocacy. Great, thank, thank you so much, Fernay. Um, so we just heard about experience in Haiti um, and in Immokalee, Florida, Florida during the, the COVID pandemic. Um, next, we're gonna move to Malawi where we are gonna hear from Sime and Emmy. Um, and um, as background, the Malawi approach to social support was um, taken in direct learning from programs in Haiti and many of our Haitian colleagues were in Malawi helping start the program that you'll hear about today. Um, and then we'll circle back to some of the, the COVID response later as well. So um, Sime and Emmy, over to you. And a reminder to everyone, the Q&A is on the right side of the screen on the website. So feel free to put your questions in there during the, the talk. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Emily uh, and everyone in the session. So allow me to start sharing about our social and economic assistance program at PIH Malawi by giving you a very quick background of where we are working. So PIH in Malawi primarily has its activities in one district called Neno. And uh, Neno is uh, one of the smallest districts in the country with about 170,000 people. Um, next slide, uh, Amy. About 170,000 people. And the district is pretty much underdeveloped with uh, uh, no tarmac roads and less than 3% of the population have access to electricity. And the majority of the families are subsistence farmers uh, living on less than one US dollar 90 in a day. So, PIH has been in the district since two, 2007 with activities mostly focusing on HIV care. And we work with the Ministry of Health in accompaniment to strengthen the health care system for improved access and high quality of care. And uh, social, social assistance, I would say, has been part and parcel of our work in the district because we understand uh, that it must be a part of the healthcare system for achievement of health as well as universal health coverage in the community. Um, our social assistance program therefore strives to fulfill clients' social and economic rights by empowering Neno's most vulnerable clients to have access to basic necessities that they require to stay healthy. So just like uh, Dr. Fenay uh, had a case study, allow me also to quickly um, uh, highlight some of the social support that PIH Malawi 
uh, provides to over 11,000 clients that are in different treatment programs, including uh, the HIV treatment program and NCD through the story of Yaya, and uh, Yaya is a pseudonym. Um, Yaya is uh, one of our longest beneficiaries um, we've had. She is currently 20 years old, and um, uh, she became our client in 2013 after being diagnosed with diabetes uh, in 2012. She was linked to our social support program by one of our community health workers and has been receiving different types of support uh, since 2013. So far, she's received support in the form of recurrent cash, uh, which she gets on a monthly basis. She's been getting food items uh, such as maize and beans, transportation support to help with travel to and uh, from the uh, hospital whenever she has an appointment. She receives clothes whenever we have them. And most importantly, um, she and her family were built a two bedroomed house and an outside toilet uh, just to support with their general um, upkeep at home. The support that Yaya receives basically covers all her basic necessities as a patient and has greatly improved and uh, sustained her health for the past eight, over eight years that she's been in our program. Um, when we reached out to her, uh, she was able to express that she would have never been able to reach the age of 20 if it weren't for the support that she receives from uh, our program which enables her to keep receiving her treatment because we are supporting her transportation, but also to respond well to the treatment that she is receiving. Uh, next slide. Now for the social assistance that we provide, there is a specific referral and assessment pathway that our clients follow in order to qualify for different um, forms of support as highlighted in the slide. The first step is client referral. So here clients are either referred from the hospital by the clinicians or directly from the community by our cadre of over 1,200 community health workers who are attached to every household in the district. Um, then the second step is uh, client assessment. Uh, so once the patient gets to the, uh, to the POSA office, which is the social and support office, there are two levels of assessments that uh, will be done. There will be the initial assessment and then there will be a follow-up home visit assessment. The initial assessment is done when the referred client gets to the social, and, uh, social support assistance office, which is usually close to the hospital and is intended to capture basic demographic and socioeconomic details about that client. The assessment intends to determine whether the client qualifies for emergency support. So this will be social, I mean, uh, cash support ranging from $7 uh, all the way to $14, or whether this client qualifies for transportation support, or qualifies for immediate inward support, assuming this patient is admitted in the hospital, or in addition to all this, whether they require a home visit. So for clients who end up um, uh, qualifying for a home visit, uh, their initial assessment is quickly followed up by a home visit, which is a detailed uh, assessment of a client's home environment. So the tool used during this second level of assessment collects data around the client's household's income potential. So we'll be collecting data like uh, household size, education levels, uh, location, where exactly is the household located in relation to the facilities, employment, health history, as well as household assets and food security, which helps the team to determine the level of client vulnerability using a final score that, in, that, that gets summed up after responding to all the questions. So after the, uh, the home visit, the assessment, um, the, the manager will review uh, the assessment scores, but will also assess, um, will also consider the assessment by the assessment officers 
recommendations. So to determine uh, if the patient is eligible for support or not, and if they are eligible, what type of support they should get. So at the moment, we are trying to streamline this client evaluation process by developing tools that can reliably and independently assess the level of client vulnerability right at the point of care, for instance, at the health facility without relying uh, heavily on subsequent processes such as the home visits or input uh, based on the experience of the officer who is assessing the client. Now, let me hand you over to my colleague, Dr. Emilia, for the next two slides, and I'll come back with some few concluding remarks. Um, over to you, Emilia. Thank you so much. So to transition from what Sime was speaking about to use of clinic-based assessment tools, we have transitioned to <clears throat> these assessments and looking at several resources that we can use to assess poverty and economic placement. We crosswalked them uh, for similar questions and started off with 23 questions taken from the equity tool, the multidimensional poverty index and the others that you see here. Through statistical analysis, we were able to bring down the numbers of the relevant questions to 10 by working with our clients in our non-communicable disease clinics. And are now are currently working with a larger sample size and validation within this population and also looking at bringing it to other populations within the district to continue to validate and reiterate um, on the tools. Some example questions are about water that you can see here, but also transportation, household item ownership and food security. Uh, just to name a few, and all of the references are here too for anyone who's interested. Uh, next slide. Another area that we're also looking at um, by screening at a clinic level is how do we tailor a social assistance package that specifically meets the client's needs, both disease-based requirements in mind, but also other personal factors. You can see here for an example of social assistance package that's developed for a diabetes patient, such as Yaya here in the example. Um, you can see uh, in the food package part, we have added beans. This is a source of protein and fat and higher um, amounts than carbohydrates in maize. And this can help control the blood sugar so that this is a staple part of a package for di diabetes patients. Similarly, in the personal items uh, support package, diabetics are frequently prone to foot infections and sores on their feet. So we've added shoes, especially for clients who cannot afford uh, shoes for themselves. Next slide. Additionally, throughout our 10 year experience working on social support, we know that it needs to be tailored for disease, person, economic status, and all, all other personal factors. In this, one, this way, the one size social assistance package really does not fit all. And even an individual on longitudinal support needs adjustment over time, depending on their illness severity, their ability to work, their family size, environment, a pandemic such as coronavirus um, or other environmental factors and requires a reassessment of support at a program level and also individual level. We're working on refining the tools for continuous assessment to change support over time, both for sustainability of the program and also for the patients in the best way possible. It may be that we could start a patient on direct social assistance and move them into schooling um, or trade work programs. From here, I'll turn it back over to CMA to finish us out. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Emilia. And uh, now as we look forward to the future of social assistance in Neno District, as well as beyond, we envision three main factors as validated through the journey of Yaya. So the first thing is the need for continued evaluation of our patients. Secondly, tailored support for patients and their families. And thirdly, designing programs for effective longitudinal support, since we are now having uh, these clients in our programs for very long periods of time, as you've seen uh, in the case study of Yaya. And I think even if we relate to the, uh, to the Haiti 
presentation. So we started with our journey with Yaya when she was just a 13 year old girl. She is currently 20 years old. We don't know how much longer we have, uh, we still have with her, but we hope it's many years. And our mission is to see how effectively we can continue to improve her overall health outcomes as well as that of many other patient, patients like her for the longest period. So thank you so much everyone for your attention and we look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Sime, Emmy, um, and welcome people who have joined us um, in the middle of this session. Um, a reminder that the Q&A is on the right side of the, the screen. There's a live Q&A for your questions. We have one question for Sime and Emmy, um, as well as for Nay, if you want to chip in, which is what, is, what are one or two key challenges in, in the practical part of implementing such a program? And do you have any advice on implementation approaches that can address those? So let's start with um, the Malawi team. Um, I'll, I'll start and my colleague can chip in. Um, from a practical point of view, um, one of the challenges that we have uh, uh, experienced is that there is always uh, great demand compared to the resources that we have to support the, the, the clients that we have. So as I highlighted in my initial slides to say, uh, Neno is a poor, uh, uh, is a poor district many, almost everyone here is poor. And um, uh, most of our clients, uh, when they get sick, if, there is all the if we had all the resources would have been saying, let's support all of them. So how do you prioritize um, uh, clients from a group that is already vulnerable? So that in itself is a huge challenge that uh, uh, our teams, as well as uh, the leadership in this environment have to deal with uh, on a daily basis. And which is why we are talking about coming up, developing tools that can now support us to objectively be able to identify among a pool of vulnerable people, how do you isolate the most vulnerable so that they can receive the, the, the support? So th that would be one of the things I would, I would share. Yeah, I would say this is really the biggest challenge when you are in the place where the needs are so great and in the midst of most vulnerable people. Uh, we understand that um, uh, having tools uh, might help. It, um, this is one because we have a lot of tools. We could see the poverty card score, we could see, but one of the strategies I found interesting used by Foncose in Haiti. It is um, looking at uh, the community uh, to help identify the poorest. And they know people who are really poor and they base on that and they help them identify the poorest and even they have the, the score, the, the poverty card score, they have all of those social determinants um, about, but they also ask for help with the community because they know really people who are the poorest in this setting, in this, uh, what we call the local uh, region and local area. This is one of the way people are dressing uh, to prioritize. And from there, they could move those people even from misery to poverty, because at some point when people are in the lowest threshold or the lowest trail, and we know that they need to get out from there before even you could make any uh, act activity, income generating activity with them, you have to make them less vulnerable because if you want to help them get out. 
All right. Thank you. We have another question um, in the Q&A for Malawi. Um, the first is, is the assistance um, that you're working on integrated into the national social system or is it a parallel one? So um, Sime and Emmy, can you speak to the, um, the system and how it's situated with the, the Ministry of Health and the public sector? So thank you so much for the question. Um, I would say not at national level, however, at district level where we are working, we work very closely with the uh, social welfare department um, such that uh, um, uh, the, the process of identification and also the process of provision uh, of the support is done collaboratively with the social support as well as the community structures. So, um, Part of our uh, work is that we, we are able to directly support some of the functions of the social welfare uh, department, but also they are able to refer uh, to us um, some of the clients that they will have identified. So I'll give an example here because um, uh, our focus maybe was on, on chronic uh, uh, clients with chronic conditions but we are also supporting uh, children that are existing in these households of these patients. So we are supporting with a um, uh, school support program where we, we are able to uh, validate the names of these clients through the social welfare department as well as the Ministry of Education. But at the same time, our housing uh, support program is also something that is direct, done directly with the support of the uh, of the social uh, warfare department great thank you so much and um I, during the panel we'll also come back to advocacy and approaches for integration of these um, programs systematically and especially into national systems um, we have one other question right now that I imagine we will also come back to in the panel discussion, but um, two people have asked us to comment on the sustainability plans and um, the idea of sustainability for this kind of assistance. So first to, first to Malawi and then, um, and then to Fernay for um, Haiti and Florida. Um, I was, uh, uh, I was expecting this question. Uh, there hasn't been any, uh, presentation we've done on our social assistance program where we've never been asked about, uh, sustainability plans. Um, but I, I, I think from our perspective as an organization is we cannot talk, start talking about sustainability if we don't have the life of this person. So I think uh, Dr. Frenet did um, allude to that in his earlier uh, discussion to say, we need to take this, these people out of that point of vulnerability before we can start talking about anything that's related to, to, to sustainability. So in the first place, um, our uh, philosophy as an organization is that um, we must do everything that we can to sustain the life of every person irrespective of what their social standing is. So um, yes, sometimes uh, it will look as, uh, as if it is, um, uh, it's challenging, I, I will say, but nonetheless, our principle or our philosophy has always been to find, go out and find the resources so that we can sustain uh, the health of these people. And once we have taken them out of that point of vulnerability, then we can link them to programs that can maybe uh, um, sub start supporting them or, um, uh, yeah, that can start supporting them with uh, how they can further uh, sustain themselves or, um, uh, yes, sustain themselves. So I think um, 
uh, that's what I, um, I can say. I'll just jump in with one quick point and um, Dr. Brene jump in as well. But I think also in terms of the, the sustaining of the life and bringing these people to a place where they can be working that many also now help support or work for the organizations across the world for partners in health and become wonderful advocates and very hard workers for the mission and also to be able to give back um, what they've received and, and the work. So many of the recipients also work with or for you know, the organization um, in that sense um, as well, which is uh, sustainable in and of itself. Fernay, would you like to oh, go ahead? Yep, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, the main point is the sustainability and people have uh, been really reinforced this aspect of getting people out of the, uh, I would say, the, out of the water <laughs> before you could even ask them to walk. <laughs> and you have to, because now people are shrinking and this is almost the same thing everywhere where the vulnerability are so deep, so, so profound. I was just going to add, so, so I, I was just going to add from Liberia, I think when we think about it, um, our experience has been, um, you know, treatment for chronic diseases, especially without social support, that's not sustainable. You don't see good outcomes and your patients die. And so this is just a, an essential part of treatment, um, not something that's added. So, you know, I think we need to get back to the basic questions about um, what is effective and bringing people back to wellness and seeing this as part of an um, effective intervention. Great, thank you so much. And we'll circle back to these ideas and thinking about advocacy and, um, and during the panel discussion as well. So thank you so much. Um, so now um, you'll hear from me again. Uh, my name's Emily, um, working in Massachusetts. Um, I actually was um, in Malawi for many years before coming back to Massachusetts during the COVID pandemic. So I learned a lot working with Sime and Emmy and others in, in Malawi about approaches to supporting the community and the importance of social support. Um, and at first glance, one might think that coming to a rich country like the United States would, would make that not as important. And But that is very far from the case. And in fact, a lot of the complexity on the ground through our work in in the pandemic um, in the state of Massachusetts is, is very, um, brings up similar challenges for people um, living, living in Massachusetts. So I'm gonna talk about the contact tracing program and how we have incorporated social support um, into our approach to contact tracing. So um, the state of Massachusetts, uh, the governor of Massachusetts um, immediately in the, in the pandemic, um, invested in the idea of contact tracing. So this is back in the middle of March when we started um, planning this and essentially Partners in Health helped stand up um, a large contact tracing program across the state in order to call all of the cases of COVID-19 and all of their exposed contacts. Um, and we went about designing this program aiming to really be a human-centered program. So moving beyond the idea that contact tracing is um, epidemiologic surveillance, which it is, but it is much more than that in terms of supporting people. So um, this slide shows the um, approach of situating contact tracing within a holistic system to support people who have and are exposed to COVID-19. Um, from 
testing so that people are aware of their diagnosis and can take next steps, to the tracing, um, calling the cases, collecting their contacts, and arranging um, quarantine and testing for contacts and isolation for cases making sure that cases are isolating there on the lower left part of the slide. And then what I'll focus on today is this idea of support. So as we call um, people on the phone in Massachusetts to let them know that they need to stay home alone for at least 10 days if they have COVID-19 or 14 days if they've been exposed to COVID-19, many people need material support in order to do that. And in fact, there isn't really a point in contact tracing if the outcome can't be that people can isolate and quarantine because that is how these chains of community transmission are stopped. And so the support there part of this is to identify vulnerability and material needs so that needs can be met and people can safely and effectively stay at home and that leads to the outcomes of contact tracing, which is to try to stop community chains of transmission. So this conversation really started um, in earnest in, in March about how do we not just call people and kind of give them information? How do we, as during this very difficult time, calling people at one of their the toughest times of their lives, ask them to stay home alone? It's very... Um, it's, it's uh, counterintuitive for, for us as social beings during tough times to actually isolate ourselves. So we took it on as um, a responsibility of the program to support people in order to isolate. So we started with who are the staff? Um, how do we design a program where this is intentionally and deliberately incorporated into a contact tracing program? Um, and so any contact tracing program would have case investigators and contact tracers. So the orange person there being the case, so case investigators calling the case, letting them know about their diagnosis if they don't know yet, um, um, working to help them understand what isolation is, collecting the epidemiologic data such as their symptoms, if they've been hospitalized, as well as collecting all of their contacts and so that the contacts can be called to let them know that they're exposed. Um, then the contact tracers would be responsible for calling all of the exposed contacts, letting them know they've been exposed and arranging testing so they can determine if they indeed have the virus and then helping them understand what is quarantine and staying home. What we did from a program design perspective was add a third cadre of workers um, called care resource coordinators. Um, and care resource coordinators are there specifically to help um, people have the ability to stay home safely and effectively during this time. So the case investigators and contact tracers in their very first phone call with people in Massachusetts um, do a home assessment, which is designed to get at the most common material um, uh, needs that people would have, um, addressing if they have food enough for the next two weeks. Um, if they aren't at work and they don't have a paycheck, what kinds of problems might that prompt? Can they pay their utility bills? It is um, now uh, getting on winter in Massachusetts, so can people pay their bills to have their heat on? Um, do they have chronic medical conditions? And if so, are their medication, do they have their prescription medications or are they gonna run out during this time period and need those delivered? Um, are they um, a mother with um, an infant who needs formula or diapers? Do they, are they a caregiver of someone and is there enough uh, masks and PPE in the household? Um, the, are there specific um, social or contextual circumstances that um, mean they might need access to a mental health provider? They might not have a primary care provider. They might have questions about their immigration status. Um, the list is very long. Um, and so we try to identify those needs on the very first phone call by the case investigators and contact tracers, prompting a referral to our care resource coordinators. So the care resource coordinators um, are an Im important group of our staff where they are committed to working with cases and contacts throughout isolation and quarantine to help address whatever challenges, whatever structural barriers that there may be to safe isolation and quarantine. Um, they are recruited from within Massachusetts communities, so they have deep 
community experience and background working with these communities. Um, they speak more than 20 languages and then they're geographically assigned across the state. So they become familiar with the with all of the resources that might be in a specific town that somebody needs. Um, very experienced group of professionals from a variety of backgrounds. Um, a large amount of them have experience in social work, nursing, psychology, health policy, um, and more. Um, and they essentially work, um, they, they came on board rapidly in March and April, April and worked to map all of the existing social support systems within the towns in Massachusetts. Um, for those of you who have worked in the United States, you will recognize that our social safety net is um, fragmented, patchworked, and limited. So this, um, this need to kind of go town by town and develop local expertise and partner with communities um, and with local organizations is, is really critical for the success of this. The care resource coordinators are not providing, so the program is not providing um, the food or providing the housing, but actually working to map it all and then link cases and contacts with existing health networks and with existing resources. Um, the other thing that we I wanted to point out as a really um, important part of this program is that in hiring such a depth of expertise, um, across uh, Massachusetts, we used the Care Resource Coordinator Program to help really focus on the human-centered side of contact tracing and bringing in training and best practices and resources, not only for the Care Resource Coordinators, but for our contact tracers on the phone for all of the challenges that they might confront when they're calling people during, um, during this time. So, um, our staff um, have developed and delivered trainings, protocols, best practices on how to talk to people about immigration, how to connect people with mental health, um, what to do if they confront an emergency on the phone, um, particularly if it's um, domestic or intimate partner violence, um, what to do if people don't have connections to the healthcare system and access to healthcare was a problem before they had COVID. Um, what to do if we are working with people who have um, different disabilities. And so there's a, a large amount of um, material that the care resource coordinators both use and develop to support uh, everyone on the phone. So I have some um, results from the program and what we've seen. And you'll remember when Dr. Fernay was speaking in Florida, it's, it's very similar in thinking about what is the need that we're seeing? And then are we able to meet that need through, um, through this program? And um, this cadre was called something different in Florida. I think it was um, health promoters or Fernay will be able to remind us at the end, but similar um, uh, um, approach to identifying need and trying to meet it for people in isolation and quarantine. Um, so we've consistently seen across the, the timeline of the pandemic that about 17% of cases and contacts do need a referral to a care resource coordinator. And that means that in their very first interview, in their first couple days of isolation and quarantine, that they are identifying a barrier to being able to stay home safely during isolation and quarantine. Um, and this amounts to about 20,000 people um, since we started in the middle of April. Um, food has consistently been at the top of the list. Um, uh, um, and a lot of this is acute on chronic uh, food insecurity. Um, and that has been the primary need that we've seen prompting extensive partnerships with local food pantries and food banks um, across the state, as well as conversations at the state level for funding mechanisms to address um, this part of the need during the pandemic. Um, there's a large range of things in other support. Sometimes um, that is um, been um, masks and other household items like diapers. Um, and sometimes that's things like legal assistance or evictions. Um, um, from um, people who can't pay their rent or paying utilities. Um, housing is a significant problem. Medication, a lot of people with, um, with COVID or exposed to COVID are suffering from other medical conditions and needed support to obtain um, and get their, their medications. Um, we see about 
12 to 15% of people report not having a primary care provider and need to be connected to one in order to get, sometimes to get a test ordered or sometimes because they have symptoms or, or conditions that need addressing. And then a wide variety of other, of other needs, um, including um, child care, um, caring for elderly family members, um, difficulty accessing testing, be that transportation or accessing the, um, the test order or charge itself. Um, and so it's a very long list of, of things that we see and work to connect people to. Um, in terms of what, um, how able we are to connect people, this is different town to town. So again, our care resource coordinators are working in a very um, geographic way where something in the western part of the state might look very different in terms of how we meet that need than in the eastern part of the state. Um, however, um, our, our data shows that 84% of the time we're able to completely meet the need in the short term. So during that duration of isolation and quarantine, um, we are able to, to completely meet the need and then another several percent where we can partially meet the need, um, which might be something like there is food, but we can't get it delivered on the weekend. Um, and it takes about two days from when we hear about um, the referral and are able to, to meet the need. That Those numbers have been getting better over time as we've learned more and more about all of the local organizations that we partner with and we've developed specific expertise amongst, amongst staff. So we know that a Spanish speaker in Eastern Massachusetts who needs food, we know our expert person who can make that happen really quickly. So this is very much um, about the um, investment in human resources in, in, a, in as well as the, um, as the need for a lot of local organizations on the ground to help, um, to help fulfill these referrals. Um, I just showed you statistics, but really this program comes to life in the stories. I think um, in Malawi and in Haiti, we've seen this as well. We have something called Notes from the Field where our staff can tell us stories about things that they see on the phone. Um, sometimes it's challenges, sometimes it's success stories. I've pulled some out so you can see the variety of complexity and, 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 and context that we see. Um, this, first, um, this first person was recently granted asylum, diagnosed with COVID-19, had just relocated to Massachusetts um, and was struggling with um, that didn't he didn't have health insurance and didn't have a primary care provider and needed medications delivered and that was the the challenges that we confronted there. Um, the second story here is um, is a, a large household as we've seen in in many uh, parts of this pandemic where the virus was getting passed around um, to household members um, and difficulties with work and income as well as some reluctance um, to ask for help but um, at, as conversations went on really uncovered a lot of assistance um, that the family needed. Um, they were struggling with utility bills um, and the landlord was trying to remove them from their house which was is not legal to do that and so the the legal assistance um, help like this and this was a very kind of local response in the town. There was an emergency um, phone number for some of these and it was a, a bit of a process but it was developing that relationship, that trust, uncovering the different types of needs and working with them and with the local resources to, to meet them. Um, these next two are, are different types of needs. Um, as school started, um, we've seen a lot of children who um, have been at home from school, particularly um, during the first surge in Massachusetts in April, May, June, um, and were not able to actually do their schoolwork because they didn't have internet access, so it was impacting young children's education. So we've developed ways to figure out how to get internet to, to families that, that need that. Um, and then the, the last story is about um, somebody with COVID-19 who had a diagnosis of, of schizophrenia and was struggling with mental illness at home um, and um, needed, needed support at home to prevent being re-hospitalized for psychiatric reasons. Um, so a very, a very complex case in, in normal times as well, uh, complicated very much by the, by the COVID pandemic. Um, and then the, the last one is again about access to care. We have many stories about connecting people to medical care for COVID reasons um, and other reasons that are complicated during isolation and quarantine times. And so it's again, acute on chronic story of people really struggling with access 
um, to, to medical care um, and working to connect them. So a few lessons learned is, as everyone knows, that COVID-19 has been disproportionately affecting marginalized and vulnerable communities. This is very true um, in the wealthy country of the United States. It's heartbreakingly true. It's very obviously true for, for everyone working on this. And we know we must design our systems to actively and systematically support cases and contacts and enable them to safely and effectively isolate and quarantine. And if we can't do that, if we can't provide that material support, the the impact and the goal of contact tracing is actually not achieved because we because we can't um, support people um, to be at home. We have uncovered and continue to uncover a large range of needs identified. We know that people's people's lives are challenging. Um, the structural issues in society have really been um, come to come to bear kind of in this pandemic and it's really exposed a lot of those underlying structural issues um, and we continue to see a large range of needs identified um, again with food consistently at the top and then this has definitely been um, working to design and implement such a program in in a place in a country where social sa safety nets are very fragmented um, and so trying to work to design the program that, that makes it local and contextualized in order to partner with, with everyone on the ground. That's been, been really important and we'll be using that to kind of advocate for, for larger picture change um, as we go. Um, so that's, that's all from Massachusetts. Um, if one of my colleagues on the line has any questions in the q and i I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions or look and ask myself the question. <laughs> Sorry, Emily, I still can't get it to load. So I don't know if Ashley or anyone else can look at the question, if there's any new questions. I don't see any on the live. Um, no problem. No problem. All right. Um, we can keep moving to Liberia. So I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce um, two more colleagues working in Liberia. Um, I'm pulling up their bios. So. Um, We've been, we've been joined by um, Ashley Dangwood and um, Dr. Maxo Luma. Um, so Dr. Maxo Luma is the executive director for Partners in Health in Liberia. He began his career at Zami La Sante caring for people with HIV and TB and later led quality improvement initiatives at the University Hospital of Mirbele in Haiti. He joined the PIH Liberia team in 2015 as an, an expert in TB and drug resistant TB strategies and clinical care, prior to his roles as executive director, Dr. Luma worked with the Ministry of Health to establish and manage Liberia's first ever decentralized drug resistant TB ward. Um, Dr. Maxo, if you could um, come on video and off, off mute to just say hello and then I'll introduce Ash Ashley. Great, you're still muted, but we can see you waving. <laughs> Great, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you and welcome. Um, Ashley Damewood is also joining us um, as the Director of Policy and Partnerships in Liberia. She has a Master's in Human Rights and a BA in uh, Law and Policy. She has worked on innovative child rights-based programming in Ghana, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and health systems health system strengthening initiatives in Navajo Nation um, and Liberia. This year, Ms. Damewood worked with the Massachusetts, um, with, with me actually, Ashley helped start um, the program I just presented on, the um, COVID-19 Community Tracing Collaborative to stand up the care resource coordination workforce while evacuated from Liberia. After nearly five months over here in the US, she is now happy to be back in Liberia today where the team is helping the Ministry of Health to operationalize its COVID-19 response and strengthen the delivery of primary care services. Ashley, if you could say hello to everyone. Hi to everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. Great. Emily, cool. if, I, if I may, I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Rebecca Cook, who is our Director of Medical Education and our Clinical Director based in Harper County. 
Harper, Maryland County, and she will be joining us remotely to contribute to our slideshow. Great. Um, so thank, thank you so much to our, our three colleagues working in, in Liberia, and we'll move on to, to your presentation. Um, and um, Ashley, if you want to bring in lessons from the Massachusetts work, I've just finished that part too. So feel free and let me know when you would like me to advance the slides. Thank you so much, Emily. So it is our privilege to present alongside our PIH family and mentors today to showcase our social needs assistance program. In Liberia, we treat our patients as our bosses, crossing footbridges as seen in this photo and doing whatever it takes to help the most vulnerable patients in the most outlying communities to achieve their health and wellness goals. Next slide, please. Together with the Ministry of Health, we are bringing quality care to the remotest and most underserved part of the country, Maryland County. Maryland County is located in the southeastern region and is home to 178,000 people. It has underdeveloped road networks and healthcare infrastructure. Many, many patients cite distance as a barrier to care. During the rainy season, which lasts more than six months in the calendar year, it can take a week to reach Harper from Monrovia, the capital city. During the dry season, it takes as many as 18 hours. As you can imagine, this poses challenges for our team as we work to move essential medicines, supplies, and staff. The referral hospital, known as JJ Dawson, is the only facility in the Southeast with all four services staffed. We have a consultant surgeon, pediatrician, internal medicine doctor, and OBGYN. Together with the ministry, we are working to make JJ Dawson patients and providers hospital of choice to really serve as an innovation and training hub to strengthen the quality of care at all levels across the county, and eventually to reinforce leadership, governance, and clinical operations across the Southeast. Often we see patients traveling from these neighboring counties and from Cote d'Ivoire to access the care that we provide because the quality and the services are there. Next slide. Maryland County is also the county with the highest rates of absolute, extreme, and food poverty in the country. Nearly 85% of people in Maryland cannot achieve the minimum expenditure to acquire basic food and non-food items. Sadly, nearly 50% are classified as extremely poor and 72% are considered food poor. We also have the largest average household size in the county with the average home including 4.9 people. We share this to explain our context and why it's critically important to deliver social support as part of our treatment plan. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Maxaluma for the next two slides. Please advance, Emily. Um, thank you, Ashley. Actually, um, this slide uh, uh, speaks actually to our model where we invest in the five SCs in order to achieve universal health coverage and build a solid foundation uh, for the provision of primary care for those who need who needs it the most. Um, to give a bit of background, we we, we um, when Ebola broke out um, in Liberia, so we were invited by the um, government of Liberia to um, to support with the response, and this was in 2014, and right after um, um at the same time we were we were participating in the response we started also investing in what we call the five s's because what we quickly understood is that um out of the um approximately nine thousand people who died of ebola we realized that ebola did not kill them Basically, the weakness of the system killed them, and then this is one. This is why we quickly made a call 
um, to stay where we've made commitment, a 25 year commitment with the government of Liberia, um, actually to support um, with uh, health system threatening to minimize uh, um, the uh, magnitude of any um, disaster related events such as Ebola or, or now COVID and so forth. So in this model, which is a very you know, holistic model, we invest a lot in what we call human capital to build local capacity to foster um, you know, lasting system by training local people um, in order to empower them to provide high quality care to those who need it the most. And in order for that to happen, we also invest in what we call the other S stuff, which is the medicine, the food, all the medical equipment, etc. We need to have a solid and reliable supply chain to continue to serve our people. And also because we believe um, in serving with dignity, we invest a lot alongside the government in public facility to give them to add dignity to the quality of care um, we provide to people in a safe and, and appropriate uh, manner. And one of this is a system where we, alongside the government and county health teams in countries where we work, we, we work to foster strong leadership in governance through uh, you know, information sharing, through financing support to make sure that government are enabled to make decisions for their own country. The one and the last, um, I myself and we all consider as one of the most critical um, um, is, is social support. In the sense that, you know, um, we all of us agree and we believe that the medicine is not enough to, um, to help people succeed, to get to help people benefit, you know, good health outcome from any treatment we provide. We, we invest a lot in tackling the social determinants of disease um, to ensure good, um, you know, care outcome in those people we serve. For the same reason that I should just you know explain um, um, before that we tend to work in the most impoverished and the most marginalized um, places and where people are living on their less than one US dollar per day, unless we invest in social support to tackle the social determinants of disease, the social determinants of health and wealth. Uh, it will be very difficult actually to help those people succeed their treatment. If we move to the next slide, I will show you, um, I will speak to something actually that illustrates that what we just said about social support. Where, as I should already said it, we, um, we treat our patients as our bosses in the four we have no interest in feeling any of our bosses. So um, this, this is a case that I'm sharing to you with you and it's a real, it's a real case where when we first started, you know, helping the country uh, with the MDRTV program, like 2017, 2018, there was a very, you know, um, good looking gentleman, 14, 43 years old, diagnosed with DRTB after many, you know, failed attempt actually to um, to 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 be treated for drug susceptible TB. So he was placed on a 20 month um, um, regime for MDRTB at the time we had some of the very toxic drugs. You can see the man; he couldn't walk, he could not do anything. He was basically bedridden. And because of his strong leadership, he was chosen as the chairman of the inpatient ward. So the same man, actually all the lab pleaded in favor of that that man couldn't die. 
but his parents already, you know, made his coffin to bury him because they lost, they lost, they lost hope. But currently, the same gentleman actually is a businessman running a big, you know, tailoring shop with many people uh, working with him now, where Surely he is currently working on, on writing a book about his memoir entitled Farewell to the Brave. If you move to the next slide, you're gonna see what this man looks like right now. So this is this is the patient you saw before, and this is who he is right now. And basically, the message is that. The medicine itself would not have, you know, brought him to where he is right now. This is why it is very important for all of us who work with partners, with donors, actually to advocate and encourage them into basically investing in social support to help people fight any single disease and by mitigating barriers actually to good um, treatment outcomes. Um, next, please. Next slide, please. At this point, we would like to have Dr. Rebecca walk us through our referral pathways. Thank you so much, Ashley and Dr. Mack. So, um, so for our team um, in Liberia, we see the entry into social support as being something that can be initiated both at the clinician level and by um, community health workers. So first from the facility level, um, patients who are taken care of in PIH supported facilities, whether it be in Maryland County or the TB Annex, the clinicians taking care of them, you know, are are oftentimes the closest and um, uh, most able to assess some of the acute um, social needs that patients have. Um, they can then fill out a social assistance request, which goes to specialized um, team of trained social protection officers who are able to then um, fill out um, a more complete evaluation, working with the patient and the caregiver to better understand their needs. Oftentimes these social assistance referrals in the hospital um, or facility can be for things like blood transfusion, which in West Africa, um, unfortunately there's not a strong culture of blood voluntary blood donation. So um, sometimes um, patients' family members will be asked to pay for blood. Um, extra nutritional support, um, particularly for those patients who are um, undernourished or extremely malnourished as Dr. Maxo has highlighted. Um, but also during um, hospitalization, more, um, more social support um, needs can be identified um, around um, needs at home um, in terms of you know, potential um, mobility assistance for disabled patients, um, needs for safe housing for patients who are ex experiencing domestic violence um, or other disruptions um, in housing stability. Um, and the social protection officers can work alongside the Ministry of Gender and Social Services um, at the county level to activate for those supports um, to be there when the patient is discharged. Um, clinicians also can activate this referral pathway um, in seeing patients um, outpatient, um, and many of our um, referrals for um, social support from the outpatient departments come for our patients with TB, HIV, and other non-communicable diseases, as has been highlighted by the Haiti-Malawi um, team as well. Next slide. But because our, um, our patients, particularly those with chronic diseases, are followed by community health workers in the community, we believe strongly that um, community health workers are an integral part of the health system um, and are closest to patients once they're in the community. So they also are empowered and trained to um, uh, advocate on behalf of the patients um, for social support. So the community health workers will communicate up to their supervisor who communicates with the social protection officer. Um, the social protection officer can then come to the household and do a home um, visit with the family um, to help do further screening um, and validation of the social support needs. Next slide. 
Um, and this is just an example of, you know, our our perspective and some of the kinds of support that are um, received by the social support program. So a large portion of our social support program goes to nutritional assistance, both inpatient and outpatient for patients who are particularly vulnerable, um, such as those with TB, um, HIV, now um, non-communicable diseases as well. And there's a strong emphasis on um, food is a basic part of treatment packages for these diseases. And as you can see, um, that particular nutritional packages are really um, customized to the patient's underlying disease. Um, next slide. Um, and it, I mean, this is just also to emphasize that social support requires, just like um, medication or running a hospital, a strong system of operations, supply chain, planning, um, and monitoring and evaluation. Um, and, you know, our team is working alongside um, any kind of clinical program that we're giving to track um, how we're giving social support, what the impact is for our patients, um, patients being lost to follow up, et cetera. And for those um, participants who were asking earlier about sustainability and advocacy with national health programs, I think that's something that we all are looking for is how we need to um, collect and share data um, and more particular operational plans to help inform ministry protocols. Next slide. I'm going to turn it back over to Ashley to go into some of the details of the data for this year. Great, thank you so much. What you're seeing here is a pilot, a new Power BI dashboard that we're using to visualize clinical data including social support. This shows enrollment data by quarter for what the Ministry of Health considers enabler packages. Enabler packages for DRTB patients include rice, oil, beans, and sardines. It also helps us to track the Liberian dollar value of the transportation support we provide to patients. It helps us to see the number of packages delivered the number of patients supported, the value of the transportation provided, and to disaggregate this by the patient's treatment phase, whether they're in continuation, intensive, community-based care, or they've completed their treatment successfully or sadly have perished. It also allows us to look at enabler support, which is more comprehensive and is personalized, as Dr. Rebecca mentioned, to the underlying needs of that household. This can include school fees, rental assistance, and support for income generating activities like the tailoring shop that we helped Bobby to set up. The transportation is calculated based on distance to the referral hospital. In Liberia, DRTB is highly centralized. And so it's important that we provide this to our patients so that they're able to come for medication refills, for focus group discussions, for x-rays and various other clinical treatments. Next slide. This helps us to get an understanding of the amount of food that we've supported in the year 2020. As you can see, we've delivered over 660 packages of food support. During COVID, we began implementing multi-month dispensing for stable patients and started to provide bulk food support three months at a time to limit the need for them to leave the home and risk exposure traveling to the hospital in Monrovia. But this visualization is so powerful for us because it helps us to see the number of patients that are benefiting and to do a quick costing analysis so that we can optimize the support. Next. And this gives you a brief snapshot of the amount of funds we've provided to ensure continuity of care. Providing this transportation support reinforces trust. They know that we're there to help them to access the care and longitudinal support they need. Over the period, we've dispersed over 1 million Liberian dollars, which is roughly 7,300 US dollars. As an implementer of the Global Fund and a strong partner to the National Leprosy TB Control Program. Next, I'm going to transition to Dr. Maxo so he can help us think about advocacy for funding and better social support. 
Thanks, Ashley. So um, actually, in this slide, we, we want to do, we want to make a call actually for all of us to start, you know, thinking how to shift um, the paradigm and how to basically be, you know, the real advocates for more funding and, you know, better social support to be allocated uh, to patients. And this is gonna require a good bit of time in investing time in whatever it takes to, um, to change the narrative around how donors and other partners, you know, uh, do business as it relates to providing, you know, um, a support that can tackle social determinants of diseases and help people get um, better outcomes. So one of the questions you want to ask today, um, if I ask someone, any of you in this room, what is the cost of inaction? What do I mean by that? What do we mean by that? What is, what is the cost of not doing the right thing, providing the right support to uh, succeed a DRTB patient or HIV patient? Well, you don't need to be a an economist, no one needs to be an economist to understand that it is it costs more because it costs much more to um, um to treat someone with drug susceptibility with cost waste less to treat that person before he or she moves toward GLTB without counting that you know on a you know I think you know um and in three years, uh, one person with TB can contaminate up to nine people uh, within three years. So just look at the cost, what it costs actually you now to treat each of those people besides taking them away from work, et cetera, and create the, the, the um, catastrophic you know, expenditure related to treatment for TB or any other disease. When you put all this together, we can we can argue that you know it costs way much more to not do it than than doing it. And you know one of the most common thing they wanna now, I mean I've been they've been using uh, an indicator like that uh, within Global Fund and as a very interesting indicator they call treatment failure. So now the question is, who fails who? Who fails who? Um, are we the one failing the patients because we fail to do the right thing? Or we want to blame the patients as our bosses to say they fail the treatment? Well, we want to believe it is the way they we run. Every time we don't do the right thing to succeed those, um, those patients, we fail them. And we, as a social justice organization, we do believe that, you know, to practice social medicine, it requires to also not only treat the, the biomedical aspect of the disease, you have to also look at the social determinant of the same disease you are, you, are, you are taking care of. And this is the only way to improve retention and care and get better um, health outcome. And we cannot talk about universal health coverage. We will never achieve that if we, if we don't keep bringing care closer to those who need it the most, where 95% of the time they will get the care they deserve wherever they are, whenever they need it. This is what it will take on to do that. And there is a need for more than PIH to consider, you know, social support as an integral part of the puzzle. Actually, we have to play, we, everybody is invited to play the entire puzzle, not a piece of it. This is what will, that's, this is what holistic, you know, um, care provision is, is about. So we want to customize social support to meet patients' need. It's not up to us. We, well, sometimes people use social package, etc., because 
That's what the ministry use, but we, the ministry use, but we don't believe in packages because we are not packages. We sit with patients to identify need and try to address um, alongside them. And, you know, our beneficiary, when we hired, you know, trusted and local people in the communities where we serve, not only we contribute into building strong their community uh, um, financially by providing jobs, but also it does increase trust in the system, in the services. Um, yeah, we, we are we are delivering with uh, with our people. Um, you know, um, um, with, with a strong component of social assistance and. Well, some people may say, well, it's expensive. It is expensive because you still doesn't do the you still don't do the job to cost in action because it's not expensive. So what we want to do today, we want again invite everyone um actually to embrace the opposite and the a new alternative in terms of what it will take really to um, to provide good quality care to people in a very holistic way. Don't play this sustainability game. It's not a good game because sustainability cannot be used when it comes to the point of feeding a wasted patient, just like the one I just showed you in the in this presentation. Um, there is no point talking about sustainability when it, when you when you have to feed that person right now with wasted, we need protein, we need all kind of food in order to help them succeed their treatment. Now we can talk about su sustainability when we teach him how to fish his own fish by helping him with you know the purchase of any kind of machine he needs to design all kind of beautiful lavas. Now today is a boss. This is what is sustainable. But food, there is nothing about food is basic human need. Everyone should access it whenever they need it. So there shouldn't be anything about sustainability about feeding our patients and our bosses and providing the social need assistance you know they have in order for uh, them to succeed on their treatment and for all of us to be happy by having good um, treatment outcome. Uh, I will stop there and, and be open um, for any questions and there's a few more time. Guys, you know, we do. Yeah. What is name? Great. Thank you so much to our colleagues. Um, in Liberia, we have one specific question for you, and then I'm going to move us to the uh, panel discussion with a question to follow up on what Dr. Maxo was just speaking about. Um, the specific question um, to the Liberia team is um, is from a colleague in in Liberia who is familiar with the work and wondering if there is any plans to integrate um, digital health into the service delivery of the the social assistance program. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, we continue to work alongside the health monitoring evaluation and research unit at the national level and at the county level with data clerks and various m and &E officers to think about ways that we can optimize data collection and really create a culture of data use so that evidence is informing decision making about our community programs, our social support, and our clinical care. The country has introduced some mobile technology already, and so that's been a huge step forward. The part that we've invested in so far is the introduction of an electronic medical record system at JJ Dawson, which allows for better registration. And we are now introducing modules to better track some of our non-communicable disease patients, who, as you learned earlier from Dr. Rebecca, are often included in our social support to improve their treatment outcomes. So we are very invested in strengthening the health information systems and we are following the leadership and guidance and have been invited to do a pilot electronic medical record system. 
Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'll, I'll be watching the live Q&A if others have questions for the panel discussion and gonna start with one building on um, er, earlier during this session, we had a few people comment on the question about sustainability, which is a common one in talking about these programs. And you heard Dr. Maxo just speak to that. So building on that, um, how have you all seen views change in, res in regarding sustainability? Have you seen decision makers um, change their views on that? And, and have you seen uptake of these kinds of um, programs by decision makers where you work? Does anyone have examples of those? So I can, I can speak to that because I remember in 2015 when we first arrived in the country and I was working in Grand Julia County, one of the you know remotest places in the southeastern region of the country. Um, it took it took us a long time actually to even convince the Ministry of Health, the county team, that we had to feed all the TB and HIV and co-infected co you know uh, patients. So well, we cannot do that because it's not sustainable to feed them. I said, but what is sustainable? Uh, letting them die because they are wasted. They don't have enough transport there in the body to bring the medicine to where they are. And they need to be because they are very anemic because they don't get fed well and therefore the drugs won't work. And this is what, what is that what sustainability is. So well, how many times do you eat yourself as a person per day? How many times do you eat rice per day? You eat rice four or five times at any moment, right? Is it sustainable for you to have it? You take per DM every time from, you take DSA from every single partner. Is DSA sustainable? It is not sustainable. Your paycheck is sustainable. But feeding a patient is the most sustainable thing we could ever do. Because you cannot wait until they get better to go their rice or while they are sick in the bed to go rice, their own rice, so they can sustain themselves. It's not gonna happen, they're gonna die before that happens. So we're gonna feed them together and we will always find a way. And then now, government fight global fund, find any other partner to add enable packages into every proposal they are writing. Although global fund has been, you know, taking them off, you know, every once in a while, but at least the country keeps fighting for, for you know, social support to be added in those proposals. I think that's a big win. I think they get a different view of sustainability now. Mm. That's that's great. Thanks so much, Dr. Max. So that's a great example. I'll I'll comment on what. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, Brene. Yeah, I will be back to the whole function of uh, function quality of life. So the scale that where you ask two simple questions: Does your health keep you from working at a job? Does your health keep you from doing work? and on the house of going to school? It is those simple questions. And the second aspect is, if you've been unable to do certain kind of, or a month of work, house work or school work, because of your health. And we know that health is the, uh, I would say major driver of uh, economic growth. And it is clear now, there's no discussion with COVID specifically. We see all the economic growth that we claim in the USA disappear in seven months uh, of the COVID. And now it is clear that the most impacted was the, uh, the most vulnerable. And uh, one of the aspects of the sustainability that we always say we never hear someone say, my life is not sustainable. <laughs> never a patient will say that, but only the expert. And this is kind of a, 
and I always say no, not the type of focus because what you take for granted, even eating every day for most of the people, it was not that. But this is where we think that the ground for the social support and to keep pushing and not only pushing, but integrate this in every single project at the DOH, at the Minister of Health. This is where we think that the universal health coverage will make a big difference in, in every country. And now is in US it is so obvious. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. I think um, we all recognize such such a need to continue to advocate and incorporate this in, in all um, programs. And one sort of story from Massachusetts is really, um, I think highlights the importance of, um, of using data, but also using specific stories to illustrate this. Because once people see it, it's, it can be very powerful. When we started in Massachusetts, uh, nobody really uh, understood what the care resource coordinators were for um, amongst many of the stakeholders and partners. But it was like, there was just some element of trust and, and sort of letting us do that. But it, it was very sort of unclear. People didn't really get it. That very quickly changed when we started showing what was happening and what needs were uncovered on the ground and, and we're bringing forward these stories and examples. And just in the course of the last um, several months, the sort of short lifetime of this pandemic, it went from um, the government essentially sort of giving us permission but not really understanding it, switching to um, developing a statewide food program for people in isolation and quarantine. And that was directly related to to not necessarily statistics, but um, but to the stories and the the need on the ground, and really kind of um, witnessing that through through the program, um, the things we were sharing. So um, I think that's like a, a very important piece of of the advocacy. And and you saw today um, before and after photos um, in Liberia and and pictures of of a patient in um, Haiti and in in um, and in Malawi. Um, so d does anyone else have examples, yeah, of, of uptake of this or, or movement we've made and, yeah. Um, I was just, go ahead, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, I would say um, uh, we have similar experiences for Malawi as well. I think for a very long time, um, there's, there was a lot of resistance to the idea. And I think uh, that resistance came because of misunderstanding uh, of the actual concept that we are talking about. I think for a very long time, uh, when you talk of social assistance, people would look at it from uh, a poverty alleviation uh, perspective. So I think it has uh, taken a lot of uh, advocacy, but also as an organization adjusting the language so we are able to effectively express what this concept is about. Because what we're talking about here is um, uh, coming up with, um, with a program that forms part and parcel of the treatment of th that, the, uh, that the patient is receiving. We're not generally targeting uh, poverty from a general point of view. We are specifically looking at the needs of the patient. So if the patient uh, has been given treatment minus the social support and they are not going to respond very well because as everybody knows, uh, for instance, if you are a TB patient, uh, for you to take the medicines, you need to have eaten first. There's no way you're going to eat uh, I mean, you're going to take the treatment before you have eaten because otherwise it's going to be the treatment that kills you. Likewise, if um, it's a patient, a TB patient who's got uh, a family of five, seven people living in one house that is not well ventilated, um, how do you support so that you prevent the spread of TB from the other household members? So when you are building a house, it's not uh, that we're just providing a house to this client. We're looking at how can we uh, support the health outcomes 
for this specific individual. So I would say for the case of Malawi, um, through a lot of uh, engagement with various stakeholders at national level, district level, uh, there's progress that has been made. People can appreciate the fact that uh, this is an important part that needs to be included in the treatment program. So just that acceptance, I would say is progress enough because currently now the discussion is how do we find resources? This is uh, a discussion where the, 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 uh, the concept is blocked outrightly. So we've had for the, uh, for the very first time during the COVID, uh, we've even have um, uh, partners like donors coming to say um, uh, we would like to, uh, to support uh, the, the COVID cases by providing you resources so you can provide social assistance in the district, but also if we can scale up uh, that support in other districts. So for us, I think that's a huge milestone as far as uh, uh, social support uh, discussion and implementation in the, in the country is concerned. Thank you so much, Sime. I, I see we're um, at the top of the hour, so it's it's my job to close and just want to thank all of the panelists and thanks everybody for joining us today as we work to advocate for including um, social support as part of universal health care. Um, we'd welcome you to contact us with any additional questions and look forward to, to working on this important work with all of you in the days, months, years to come. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Thank you.